thank you, Alex, for giving me the opportunity to interview you. This is part of a research project for a business school uh, set in Barcelona. Um, I'm quite interested in risk management as a whole. Um, you know, um, I'm working in Germany for an international company. Uh, my profile is in, in engineering, engineering uh, system engineering company. Mm -hmm. So, well, as um, my company is a government company, and it's a little bit reluctant to adapting in risk management as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm quite interested in some of your, some of your research, especially in, in the field of um, strategic planning phase, mm -hmm. together with, uh, with risk management, which I find very interesting. And you've you've so sent me you've sent me an email in preparation for this where I, I think you've asked some really really interesting questions and um, let's just go through them because I think that will kind of help us structure the discussion. Okay, perfect. So the, the email I sent to you is uh, I have a, a couple of questions. The first one is: Do you know if any company integrates to the strategic planning? Yeah, I, I do, and I'll share. Uh, some... And if it... yes, I, I do, and I'll share some names with you uh, probably towards the end of our conversation because there are uh, when you say integrating risk into strategic planning, that actually means quite a lot of different things to different people. So we will first kind of go through all your other technical questions, and then we'll come back to some examples at the end. Okay, perfect, uh, fantastic. So and another concern I have is um, many organizations um, the managers are against ISO standards. You know, they see as a bureaucratic process. I don't, I don't see any any value added. So in my survey I send it out. It was one person why why an ISO why integrating ISO thirty one thousand. Mm -hmm. My question is how this standard ISO thirty one thousand can contribute to risk management in the strategic planning? Okay, well, I mean, that, that's a very good question. Um, ISO has uh, probably hundreds of thousands of standards. So any, any kind of broad statements about ISO being bureaucratic or not be, being bureaucratic are, are clearly not true because ISO has so many different standards that some of them are bureaucratic, some of them aren't. And, and just any kind of broad statements is you know, is probably a way trying to deceive you into believing something that is not true. I, I mean, executives all over the world use all sorts of excuses to not apply proper risk management. And ISO being bureaucratic is just yet another simple excuse. It's uh, it, there, there's like there's no substance behind it. Uh, and specifically, when we look at ISO thirty one thousand, the document is fifteen pages, and it actually doesn't say anything about what you have to physically do. I mean, the only, the only uh, document, physical document on the paper that is mentioned in ISO 31000 is a risk management policy, which is a one-page document. Um, so, so hardly you can argue that ISO 31000 is creating some sort of bureaucratic process. Um, it, it outlines how risk-based thinking and risk management and risk analysis needs to be part of decisions, key processes, and key activities, but in reality, it doesn't actually tell you how to do it. So every organization may choose to do it bureaucratically or completely, you know, freely discussion type, you know, agile, um, create some sort of environment where risks are just being discussed. So, so there's, because the document is so ridiculously high level, uh, which is, you know, one of the criticisms of uh, auditors, for example, they don't, for example, they don't know how to audit alignment or um, the integration of ISO 31000 because it is so not specific in, in any sense. Um, so I would like, I, I usually, I hear a lot of those excuses. I just ignore them because they're not tr they're not real. This is not a real reason why risk management is not being integrated. There are real reasons, which I'm sure we will talk about uh, later. Uh, so ISO. 31,000 is uh, is a quite a good document because it's a good document for us risk management professionals 
because it's so high level, we can literally do anything we, we feel is appropriate for that type of company, that type of environment, that type of context, that type of decision. And in fact, what the ISO 31000 is now explicitly suggesting, even though it was since 2009, it was kind of implicit in the discussion, but now ISO 31000 is explicitly stating that in the document is that there should be numerous risk management processes within a single organization. That means for strategic planning purposes, there would be one risk methodology. For budgeting purposes, there may be another one. For investment, there may be a third one. For, for procurement, there may be a fourth one. For uh, project management, for production planning, for marketing, for sales, there may be dozens and dozens of different risk management processes. Now, I was... Um, the, my last kind of full-time full -time position was ahead of risk of one of the big Russian investment funds. And we had five, I as a head of risk, had five different risk management processes um, documented within the organization. So to, to come back to the question. So, so... Yes, please go on. No, no, this is, a, this is a, what I, uh, I wanted to ask you, how, how can country contribute? to risk management in the strategic planning? The ISO, the, the current version, that is the current draft that we have kind of seen at the end of last year, which was approved, if I'm not mistaken, by 96% of the countries participating in the updates of the ISO 31000, um, that will be out early February, which means soon. And uh, um, the document is so high level that it basically says, like the fundamental message is, that risk management is not a standalone activity. Risk management is not done for the sake of managing risks. Uh, risk management is not an objective in itself. Risk management is an integral part of core activities, processes, decisions, and uh, business, business processes, business activities, decisions, projects, investments, and, and so on. So strategic planning being one business activity that is done on some sort of frequency, it's annually, or maybe if it's you know, very long-term horizon, could be done like three years or five years, it actually doesn't matter. It's just yet another business activity. So just mm -hmm. like you would implement, integrate risk management into procurement or budgeting, strategic planning is yet another business process where risk management can be integrated. And that's the fundamental message that ISO 31000 is driving. So I, the whole idea of ISO 31000 is say, Risk management should not be done on just some sort of regular frequency for the sake of better managing risks. Risk management should be done when it's time to make an important business decision. And um, I mean, judging by the uh, research done by uh, corporate executive board, Deloitte, and some scientists in a, in a wonderful book, which is called um, Billion Dollar Lessons, um, and the research by, by Deloitte is called Value Killers. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty old, but all of those documents, all of those research papers basically say that quite a significant percentage of corporate failures, of corporate collapses, uh, shareholder value drops, um, is attributed to strategical mistakes. So strategic planning, like if we're thinking on a broad you know, spectrum of different business processes within the organization, Strategic planning is probably one of the first things you would want to look at as a risk manager to integrate risk management into that because companies have historically lost billions on making poor strategic decisions or poorly executing the strategy that has been approved by the organization. Um, so so it's, it's definitely an important aspect of, of business and ISO is saying that's where risk management should be. It should be where the most important decisions are being made. So strategic planning, that kind of fits perfectly. Risk, risk management is a, is a wonderful decision-making tool, and um, we could theoretically implement it into absolutely any decision within the organization, even the very bottom operational decisions on like which equipment buy this or that. Um, but we should start with something that is absolutely fundamental and critical, and strategic planning is that. You can't get more important than strategic planning, probably. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you. Uh, that clarified me a lot. Well, the next question 
Uh, this is a very tough question because it's about uh, risk perceptions. You know, there is always a dilemma in risk management. Uh, so how can we change the risk perception or influence to remove uncertainty? Can, can you please repeat the last part of this, the question? So how we can change the risk management perception on influencing to remove uncertainty? Now, clarify what you mean by that, because risk perception is actually a well-defined term and it means something different, I think, to what you're trying to ask. Okay, so what, what I'm trying to, 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 to say is, okay, now each person has a different view on, 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 on risk. No? Some, 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 a person can be very, very, uh, you know, like uh, the Amazon uh, uh, yes. CEO very willing to, to set uh, any risk, you know, he's trying the different ways of, of businesses, which at the end, it, it, it did work perfectly. Yes. So, but some of the decisions has been a total uh, fiasco. So, but you know, you, you can see people very conservative and people very, very, uh, very uh, willing. Th that's true. About uh, risk management, how, uh, how can we deal with uh, this uh, risk perception in, in order to, 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 you know, to, 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 to find, because uncertainty at the end, you know, people can say, you know, I can, I see this very risky, you know, another guy says, no, no, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. So how, how we deal with that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a complex question in the way that, you know, answering it properly and giving it properly and giving it justice will require a lot of time. So I'll, I'll try and kind of, you know, summarize uh, summarize the answer um, and the the first part of the answer is risk perception is actually a well-defined scientific term there is actually a whole field of study that goes under the umbrella of risk perception and uh, it's it's a study associated with how human brain works in situations of uncertainty and how humans make decisions in situations of uncertainty how human brain works in general when we are faced with uncertainty and how we make decisions as a result of our brain kind of interactions. Um, that, stud that, that field of study um, not only has two Nobel Prize winners in economics, and, and that's interesting, Nobel Prize winners not in psychology, um, n not in biology, but in, in economics. So it's, it's actually all about making economical um, money decisions, business decisions, in situations of uncertainty. So clearly something that is supposedly very close to us. There was a Nobel Prize in 2002 to Daniel Kahneman and Vernon Smith, and there was another one just last year in 2017 um, to the guy who wrote book Nudge, which I, which I cannot remember his name. Um, but there's there's been a lot of research. There's been so much research that Wikipedia has a page called Risk Perception. And that is the page in Wikipedia that every single risk manager who is attempting to integrate into any kind of decision making with his tools should know by heart. Those are the, those are the studies that all risk managers who are attempting to move away from quarterly risk reviews or risk assessments to integrating into decision making, these are, these are the studies that every risk manager needs to understand because they significantly impact on how people make decisions. It's important to understand how people in general make make decisions. So what what you will discover and what, what I'm sure you have discovered already is that uh, not only different people have different takes and appetites for risk, more importantly, I mean that, that's part of the story. Some people are more risky and some, some people are more risk averse. Um, that's kind of that's that's a challenge, but it's a much bigger challenge is that every single person, despite on how risk averse or risky they are, they're actually subject to over 200 cognitive biases. And that literally means that unless a miracle happens, most executives will probably fall into quite a few cognitive biases when making strategic decisions. And most uh, managers and middle managers and employees will continue to fall into those biases when executing those decisions.
So there's actually, there, there are a lot of pitfalls, a lot of stumbling blocks that human can stumble over when making an important decisions in situations of uncertainty. And again, if we're kind of saying like in procurement, there's, there's some uncertainty. If you're buying a new piece of equipment or a new raw material, there's sh surely some uncertainty. But if we're talking about strategic planning, and this is what you're studying, that just that uncertainty just escalates. 10 times, 100 times, because if we're, if we're talking about not the today decision about buying something or tomorrow's decision about investment, we're talking about 3, 5, 20 years in, in advance sometimes. So that you can't get more uncertain than that. And that basically means that the perception and cognitive biases of individual managers will have a huge impact on how strategies are defined and how strategies are executed which basically means that if well to me this means that if the risk manager is going to integrate risk into the strategic planning then risk manager knowing that people are subject to cognitive biases people are subject to these different risk perceptions on top of that some may be risk averse some may be risk aggressive uh, risk manager must absolutely make sure that whatever tools he brings to the table, whatever tools he's introducing in the risk management, in this sorry, in the strategic planning process, whatever tools he's introducing, the, those tools are specifically designed to address the cognitive biases and differences in risk perception. That basically means if the only tool that risk manager brings to the table is a workshop where risks are discussed, mapped out on paper, and then qualitatively discussed and, and kind of agreed, um, that means the risk manager has failed because that tool, that qualitative discussion, not only did not protect the decision makers from cognitive biases, it probably reinforced them significantly. And everybody in, everybody in the room will feel super comfortable and confident that they have actually done a good job, when in fact they probably deceived not only themselves but everyone else in the room, uh, in, in the room as well. So to me, this kind of topic of risk perception is very important in the sense that risk managers, whenever they bring tool, a particular tool to a discussion and they usually have to bring a set of tools to integrate properly into strategic planning. Um, whatever they do that, those tools have to be um, not bulletproof because none of the, unfortunately, when we're dealing with uncertainty, none of the tools are bulletproof. All of them have their own flaws. All of them ha can and probably will contribute to the overall cognitive biases uh, um, and errors that these create. Uh, but the risk managers must ma make sure that as much as possible, the cognitive biases have been reduced throughout the process. Uh, that means, for example, an activity that uh, Douglas Hubert, in his book, Why Risk Management is Broken and How to Fix It, or in his book on how to quantify and, and measure everything, um, that that's, uh, he, he, um, he kind of, he promotes or um, suggests that a, 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 a step on calibration is a necessary one. You actually, whenever you ask somebody of an opinion and you want to reduce their inherent biases and you want to kind of level the risk aggressive versus risk um, uh, averse uh, individual perspectives, uh, you have to calibrate people to let them some, let them themselves realize just how risk aggressive they are, how risk averse they are, and that maybe they should kind of change that behavior or change that attitude for the specific strategic planning, uh, strategic planning activity. So clearly the whole study of risk perception is huge. And in fact, the, the book that came out a couple of years ago, which is called Billion Dollar Lessons, is actually a very interesting study on that. The, um, I think three or four scientists, which I cannot remember their names, but it's an easy book to find, like a big yellow cover. Um, they have taken 40 largest corporate collapses and they have studied, well, what were the root causes? What were the fundamental reasons why that happened? Now, clearly, 
nobody will ne ever know the truth. Like, you know, most things, most collapses that happen, they usually have multiple reasons. Most of those we will never find out because, you know, corporate culture is not transparent and it's not nice. Um, but they have kind of attempted to pinpoint what are some of the issues. And, and of course, fraud, corruption, uh, that's one of them, but actually a very small percentage. A much bigger percentage is people falling into cognitive biases, ignoring the obvious risks, disregarding the information that was given them, uh, falling into, for example, confirmation bias, where their brain filtrates and they only see information that confirms their, their hypothesis, and they automatically reject everything else, everything alternative, um, which is what risk managers do when they see my videos. Um, yes. They, they, <laughs> they um, listen to the five seconds at the beginning, which kind of confirms that quarterly risk assessments are good, and then they ignore the rest of the video because it, con it con contradicts their view of the world. Um, so that's always funny, you know, reading their comments uh, underneath the video, which is obvious that they have not understood okay. the fundamental message. Uh, so risk perception, super important to understand how human brain works when making decisions under uncertainty, because, it, again, this is my personal perspective, but I think risk management is first and foremost a decision-making tool and the whole idea of uh, risk management tools, and we have a, a tool set, the whole idea of risk management tools ultimately is to switch the decision makers from system one thinking to system two thinking. Now, if those two words don't mean anything to you, then that's a good indication that, you know, and I don't mean you, I mean this for the broader audience who will listen to this, uh, um, this po podcast later, this interview later. Um, if that my statement that the whole purpose of risk management tools is to switch a person from system one thinking to system two thinking is meaningless to you, then you should really, really go and investigate the work of Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, because that's ultimately what risk management is about. Um, if strategic planning is just done how it has been done historically, the classical kind of approach to strategic planning, people are guaranteed to fall into cognitive biases and they're guaranteed to make a lot of mistakes along the way, both in the strategy selection and in the strategy kind of mapping out and executing. So risk management m helps. It's not a panacea. It's not going to protect and change the world. Although I have changed the world a couple of times when I integrated risk into the strategic planning, uh, changed the world so much that the whole strategy had to be rewritten. Um, but the, 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 you know, it, it depends. It depends. It kind of risk management is really good and impactful if the strategy is bad. Because if the strategy is bad, then risk management will immediately highlight just how bad it is. So I was, I was lucky. I saw a couple of bad strategies and it was very easy to um, model some of the scenarios to show just how bad they were and have a significant impact. But if the strategy is, is already good, then risk management is quite a useful tool to confirm the hypothesis that this is the right thing to do. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for the, your recommendation about the book. Sounds uh, really, really nice uh, to read. And of course, uh, I, 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 I agree with you that risk management is a tool to, to support decisions, no? It's, it's not imposing, but it's, it's confirming if your strategy is going in the right direction or not. So, um, Alex, uh, I sent out also a prototype of just a process model. It's just uh, um, some ideas that it have collected. Uh, it doesn't mean that um, it's fit to any specific uh, sector. It's just a generic uh, process. And I would like to ask you a couple of questions about this. I don't know if you have time to, to check on this PDF file about a prototype. I did have but, a look at it, uh, yes. Yes, my, my question is, the first question is, do you think that this prototype can fit in all sectors? Or, or this is not 
uh, you know, it's too generic for, for specific sectors. Uh, what do you think about this? Um, instead of answering that question specifically, what I wanted to talk to you about is that when thinking of a risk management, uh, not sorry, not risk management, the strategic planning process, uh, I have, and I mean, two months ago or a month ago, I probably would have answered it differently. But since then, I've been reading some of the interesting work done by Hans Lisso. Uh, he, he's the next CRO of Lego. And uh, um, he is talking a lot about integrating into strategic planning specifically. So an idea for the next interview, I think, is uh, is definitely for you, Hans. Um, but his, his, his work kind of gave me an interesting idea is that when we're talking about integrating risk management into strategic planning, there are actually different steps or stages of strategic planning. And those different stages will require different ways of integrating risk management. And maybe instead of kind of answering the question about the prototype, I'll give you some of the thoughts that I had on that. And then you can, you can later figure out whether that fits or whether the changes required to your prototype. Now, what I have discovered okay. is that there are kind of three building blocks in strategic planning. And ultimately, the first one is about creating or figuring out the strategic direction. It's like, should we go, for example, should we go online or should we go to physical stores? Um, should we invest in um, energy or should we invest in like renewable energy or should we, you know, fundamental strategic choices uh, huge and that's that's actually a very separate part of the strategic planning process um, then the next one is about mapping out and budgeting and creating KPIs around that selected strategy so the first part is about selecting the direction. So we will go online. And then the second so, part... So the first part should be the objective, no? The first part should be what? Setting the objective. Well, it's it's not even... It's not even the... the setting the objectives. It's, it's not yet even the objective stage. It's, it's setting the overall direction. It's like selecting a mission or something, a vision. It, it's, it's something big, like... We are going to go global, for example. And then the second mm -hmm. part is actually quantifying that and setting out the objectives. So, you know, it's one thing to say, let's go global. And then okay. in, in the second part, that's where you say we will global for us actually means we will go to Australia and we will go to Latin America. That's global for us. And this is how much money we're going to make in Australia. This is how much we're going to invest in Australia. This is how much we're going to invest. So the second part is all about giving some, some specific details and quantifying most of the things that kind of associated in that vision. So vision is a very high level. We're going to go online or we're going to go digital or we're going to go global, something super high. Now, obviously, companies cannot execute just the vision. It has to be mapped out into more specific details. And so the second step is all about mapping out. And that's when kind of that's when the creativity stops and the corporate fighting begins. Because that's when every executive is trying to get more, more budget for his own activities. That's when all the conflict starts. That's when all the kind of underground games um, and, and everything else. Like that's when the budget is basically pulled together. Like that's when the financial model for that strategy is built, saying that we will actually this strategy will actually allow us to make this many billions over the next seven years or five years, because somebody quantifies that. Like that that's a, that's a very important part. And uh, the third one is execu executing. So that's year after year they executing and they translate that strategy into annual budgets. And then they go and deliver. Um, now, there are different risk management tools applicable to every step. So there are three very distinct steps. And the first step is all about creativity. It's all about finding different scenarios, testing them, and kind of trying to figure out which is the best scenario. And that's where the tools that... You know, starting from like the most basic SWOT, PESTLE, um, 
business model analysis, yes. war gaming scenarios, and literally all those other things usually happen. Now, risk managers theoretically can be involved in um, running simulations and war games and uh, participating in all those activities. I have, I, I think Hans Lisu from from he used to he used to head the risk at Lego. I think he's the only person who I have met who's actually been involved in that kind of upfront activity. I was probably I was I was lucky in the way that strategic direction for mm -hmm. the companies where I worked, was set by the government and it was set ages ago. So we kind of knew what the strategic direction was. For us, it was all about quantifying how do we get to that strategic, uh, strategic direction. So all of those less quantifiable, more um, judgmental and philosophical tools and uh, simulation tools, they are more appropriate for this first stage. And that's, I, I mean, technically speaking, that's probably risk management, but reality is strategic department or external consultants, facilitators, usually take care of that stage. I actually haven't met a lot of um, risk managers who would do like a, a, a simulation war gaming exercise um, upfront to kind of to come up with the, what's the best direction. I mean, that is a very exciting place for the risk managers to be. And it's definitely something worth for you investigating in your research paper uh, because that's that's where a lot of value can be brought in. Because cognitive biases are huge. People, people really do not see scenarios that are available to them because people are very short-sighted, they're closed-minded. And some of the some of the you know risk some of the philosophy that risk managers have may help bring that out. So that's all about working together with the strategic department. The first step is risk people working with the strategic department to come up with something or external consultants, it really depends, um, to come up with a vision, an overall direction. Now the second part is mapping out, giving more detail and quantifying once the vision has been selected. Who gets how much money, which projects are we going to invest, how much are we going to invest, uh, what's the foreign exchange going to be, what's the inflation going to be for the next, um, for the next few, few years. And that's where a completely different set of tools come in, comes in. And that's where risk managers already should be spending 80 or 90% of their time. Like this is where risk management is super valuable. And that's where, where we have scenario analysis, simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, sensitivity analysis, and possibly decision trees on some of the, uh, some of the finer, finer details. So there are four very specific tools that risk managers can use in this uh, second part of the strategic planning, uh, strategic planning process. And that's where risk managers work much more closely with the CFO than the head of strategy. So in the first part, it's risk manager plus the head of strategy, usually. They're kind of facilitating everything. In the second part, it's head of risk with the CFO facilitating the discussion because that's where the financial model is being built. And as soon as that financial model is presented or is, is drafted, then the same second risk manager can apply, comply, apply Monte Carlo simulations to test some of the assumptions test some of the hypotheses to show how realistic is the version of the future that management has selected for themselves. And, I mean, and I've had so much fun in these exercises because I've done them a lot. And it's, it's an unbelievable feeling coming to the CEO and the other executives saying, this is a wonderful strategy that you've created. There's a 3% chance that it will happen. And there's a 97% chance that it will not happen. And I can actually tell you by how much it will be missed 95% of the time. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling when you can actually start quantifying things and you can show you that, well, we've tested some of the basic hypotheses, we've tested some of the assumptions, and they just do not hold true. That's where a lot of value risk managers can bring because if in the vision everybody's kind of on the same boat and everybody's sharing the vision. Usually there's less 
undercover kind of conflict in the vision setting, in the direction setting. Everybody kind of agrees that the vision should be, you know, either innovative or protective. Like there's usually some sort of agreement. When we get to the second stage, we, we, which is all about cutting the pie into different individual money budgets, that's where not only cognitive biases play a part, but hidden agendas, conflicts of interest, hidden motivations, and, and just a lot of other horrible human behaviors start playing in. And, and uh, risk managers can bring a lot of value by saying, you promising a you know a 15% return on investment um, but we've tested the market it's physically impossible and if we just assume for a second that the return is not going to be 15% but it may be between somewhere between 5 and 20% and uh, uh, more likely it will be less than 15 you can see that this completely destroys the whole strategy so clearly the assumption that you're proposing and you're convincing everyone that is important is huge and it just doesn't hold truth. We need to either take specific actions to reduce the level of uncertainty, to manage risk associated with that, or we need to make assumptions more, more, more pessimistic or more realistic, whichever way, whichever way you want to put it. So there's a lot of fascinating work that happens in the, the kind of strategy breakdown mapping out stage where all the most interesting quantifiable tools can be used by, by the risk managers. Now, the challenge, of course, is that many risk managers don't have the competencies to use those tools. So they continue the workshop type discussions with people, um, which are great fun for self-esteem and executives probably don't mind them because it's physically impossible for the risk manager to ask the tough questions if no numbers are present. If it's all about opinions and just you know, people's words and feelings, it's actually very difficult to challenge someone saying, you're making a mistake or this assumption is completely unrealistic or these are the most critical projects, but yet we don't spend enough attention on them. So m many risk managers fall into the cognitive biases trap where they themselves do mm. not see the, the real risks because the tools that they use do not allow them to see those real risks and hence to show that to the executives. Yeah, I, I find it very fascinating uh, the tools that uh, you have explained to me. Um, to be honest, um, uh, I have uh, been to investigating more on the, on the tools because, uh, I mean, to, most probably many, many, many companies are using to, um, very... Um, not old fashioned, but uh, um, most probably the, the SWOT, the SWOT one. Yes. That uh, make it a little bit clear for for high managers. You know, if you go through Monte Carlo, you know, try to justify, quantify. Um, sometimes they they are getting a little bit lost. But uh, it's true that um, I, I really like it your way of thinking that uh, it should be a scientist process. Uh, how we can and have uh, both these is different scenarios how we can test it and it's working or not and uh, this should be the, the way of doing that especially for large projects you know that you invest a huge amount of money you know taking the risk of having a, 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 you know, basic tools might be a total a total disaster at the end of the project so yeah you answer my, my second question about um, you know the, the tools that i propose in the in the um, prototype and so coming back to your prototype, coming back to your prototype, I'm actually just looking at it. And I think the message that I'm trying to say is that in the prototype, you look at the strategic planning as a kind of a single uh, continuous process. And uh, maybe uh, a better way to look at strategic planning is in some sort of like distinct stages, because creating vision and alternatives is very different to actually mapping out and breaking down into and building the financial Financial model. I did, I did the breakdown in three stages. And one is the analysis, another is implementation, another is uh, add. I tried to, to come up with the PD, uh, PDCA uh, process. Yeah, I, I, I see that. So, like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, try to simplify a little bit, not to make it uh, very, very complex. 
uh, try to make things uh, a little bit easier to somebody. Sure, sure, sure. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is that looking at the or at the process that you have mapped out, um, that makes total sense. If just for, for for a second we take the analogy with the three distinct steps that I have described, you have captured the analysis and implementation. That's the second one, and uh, monitoring, control, and act. That's the third one. Uh, I think the first one where the whole like vision decision is created that that's kind of the one missing in the picture or it's part of your analysis which i'm sure it is um, but they are very distinct because at the top you have the three tools swat scenarios and monte carlo and actually there are a there are more tools and those tools are actually very distinct some of them only apply to the first stage which is all about creating the general direction and others, like scenarios and Monte Carlo, they only apply to the kind of the financial model stage. Because you, you don't do, you, you probably wouldn't do Monte Carlo at the initial stage when you're just selecting general the kind of uh, direction of the business. You may do scenarios, but you, you're probably even better off with, with like war games or some other um, less quantifiable uh, simulations to understand how the market will uh, will. will that's a fantastic idea. Um, I'm, I, I will improve uh, this model based on, on, on your inputs. Uh, for instance, uh, trying to improve the first state and analysis, trying to, to set the vision and these type of things. Also, the tools try to divide in, in three different uh, stages, maybe for, for, for the analysis and implementation uh, and, the, and the third one. Try to divide and see what tools is for each stage. Which is uh, fantastic. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a uh, this is a great idea. And my last question, well, yes. my last question is um, third question is, do you think that the, this process could help having a strategic planning? I know that uh, many companies already has strategic planning. Some like small businesses companies might not have any. So what do, what do you think about this? Uh, do you think this maybe introducing some changes can help? Or not? Most organizations have strategic planning in general. Um, most organizations equally don't have risk managers participate in these strategic planning activities, or they have very limited participation, maybe as a visitor or as a contributor, maybe as part of like a qualitative risk discussion. Historically, I think the problem has been why why executives, you know, strategic planning is a very high visibility process. That's where all the board members, independent directors, executives, even like we, we had, you know, representatives from different ministries involved in our strategic planning. It doesn't get much more high profile than that. Like strategic planning is a very, um, very, very important business process because everybody pays attention. And everybody's involved, everybody's trying to kind of participate. And uh, um, historically, many risk managers weren't really allowed to get involved in the strategic planning process, uh, primarily because they didn't have anything good to offer. Because if, if, if finance department is already using scenarios, which they do, most strategic plans have an element of scenario planning. There's always scenarios on the financial model during the strategic planning process. If the finance department is already doing it themselves, and the best the risk manager can offer, and he said, oh, let me, let me in the process, let me participate. And, and so everybody asks like, okay, so what are you gonna bring to the table? What can, what, what's, what's new amazing insight can you add to our discussion? We already have our three scenarios. And uh, the risk manager goes, oh, the best I can offer is let's all get together and let's talk about different opportunities and, and threats and uh, let's have a brainstorm. And, and they go, well, well, you know, it's nice, but we are, you know, very rich, high profile people. We have, we have representatives from ministries and uh, yes, we can kind of play it and treat it as a game to satisfy the ministers, to show them that we're doing, you know, wonderful risk stuff uh, and we're kind of in trend. Uh, but it's it's not it's not real, like it doesn't really provide amazing fundamental insights that completely change the whole game. Um, 
So what risk managers need to start doing is, is they need to start contributing something, something that can actually change the strategy, something that can rewrite the strategy, something that can challenge and not just say, oh, I don't feel comfortable. This strategy seems risky. But you need to be able to, like, if you're talking to the CFO, he will kill you within like five seconds at the board meeting. Uh, if you're saying, I feel this is risky, and he'll just shoot numbers at you. You can't really have a conversation about feelings with somebody who has all this ammunition. You need to bring proper ammunition to the table. So all of these tools that we have talked about, sensitivity analysis, scenario analysis, Monte Carlo simulations, and decision trees, they actually provide risk managers with quite significant insights. I mean, to, to be fair, there's a very small percentage that the strategy is already amazing and the finance has already done a wonderful job. They've, they've run their scenarios and risk manager has nothing else to contribute because everybody done a wonderful job. It's a perfect process. There's nothing else that risk manager can bring to the table. There is a very small percentage of that happening. What happens in reality is that cognitive biases are so significant and hidden agendas are so significant that people actually create Frankensteins. They create a strategy that has close to zero chance of actually being properly delivered and implemented because they create a strategy for themselves, not for the organization as the whole. And risk manager can come and challenge a lot of those a lot of those things, even with scenarios. I mean, this is what I've discovered is that one of the like one of the internal challenges that risk managers always have is that finance is already doing it. Strategy is already doing it. How can I come in and, and do it again, duplicate or do it differently with them? Because what I have discovered is finance always does scenarios, but finance motivation is very different from the risk management motivation. In fact, they carefully select scenarios to not show the real problems. Because for them, if, they, if somebody discovers that the, the budget doesn't add up, that means they have to redo the whole thing. It mean, means weeks or you know, months of extra work. So they're constantly pushing. And if somebody discovers, which I did once, if somebody discovers that there's a liquidity problem in three or four years, if this strategy gets approved, I mean, that, that, that looks bad for the CFO. And that is a conflict that he's, he'll do anything to avoid. So finance department, as well as strategy, they will do a lot of, you know, shady things to not show the real risks because real risks scare people. And, you know, we, we operate in a relatively risky environment. So somebody has to be, somebody has to be the guy, the kind of, they don't want to be the troublemakers. The risk manager he usually, I mean, I, I always felt that risk managers and internal auditors have nothing to be scared of and nothing to lose. I mean, losing the job is the worst thing that can happen. I mean, uh, that's not the, really the end of the world. Um, the But e even that, you know, risk managers, by doing the right thing, they usually have enough support at the board level that they it would be pretty difficult to fire them. Um, but anyway, the... You know, the risk managers have to be the troublemakers because that's the stage where people are so excited about moving into a new direction, making new strategy. Uh, executives are super excited because that usually means they will get new budgets and new yep. money to spend. So everybody's super excited. And this is when the risk manager needs to be brave enough to play the role of what the Christian church called devil's advocate. So somebody who his own job, his only job is to challenge some of the assumptions made by the rest of the people in the team. And if everybody feels excited about there should be someone, you know, rocking the boat in, in the room. Otherwise, statistically, there's a very high chance of this strategy failing immediately or years later. But that book called Billion Dollar Lessons is a wonderful study. It shows that when everybody's in agreement, when everything is exciting and everybody's happy, you know, companies end up losing billions. So, yeah. so it's you know, statistically speaking, you know, humans are not that good at strategic decision making, and there are a lot of you know, a lot of money lost 
associated with that. And even just judging by the kind of life expectancy of companies, 100 years ago, the life expectancy of a large corporation was much longer than it is now. We've already lost, you know, multi-billion dollar businesses and we don't hear of other huge companies like, you know, Nokia, they still have operations, obviously, in, in the networks. Um, but, you know, companies, a lot of companies have disappeared, even in our lifetime, that were once thought of completely unbreakable, forever, you know, revenue generating, you know, cash cows. Um, so life is, uh, life is risky and risk management... Uh, <laughs> can add a lot of interesting insights with the right tools, the right tools that overcome the cognitive biases. And the only missing component for many is being brave enough to apply them in strategic planning. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, the last question, uh, I think you, you already reply in, in this one, is how can help risk management in the strategic planning? It's, it's obvious that um, it's, it's a, a little bit perspective you know, of the managers, how important risk management is, no? Um, you know, so you, 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 some companies are battling and say, no, no, we don't need risk management because in the strategic planning, because we know how to do it, no? I think this is the, the, the big uh, sometimes mistake of some companies that uh, doesn't look, look uh, risk management as a tool to help out in this strategic planning. There are many, but, uh, there are many, many reasons why you know this. The, the clearly, I mean, we it's 2018, and I, I think well, it, it kind of depends. People will argue, but to me, it's very obvious that the connection between risk management and other business units and business processes, strategic planning being one of them is not that good. It, it should and could have been so much better. The connection between risk and strategic planning, for example. Um, some individuals achieve great results, like some of the people I worked with in Russia, for example. Um, some of the people I know in Europe, and I'll, I'll end up by sharing some, uh, some companies' names. I actually don't know that many, but I'll, I'll share some. Um, that achieved that connection and actually got amazing results as the, uh, 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 at the end. Um, but there are many reasons why that doesn't happen, and uh, uh, some of the some of the reasons they kind of on both on both sides. Uh, I think the easier one to fix is that risk managers a usually don't have the courage to come to the head of strategy or come to the CEO and say involve us in the process. They're so um, because it's it's complex, it's difficult. I mean, the only reason I I was involved in the um, strategic planning process is because I was luckily so naive that when I joined the company and I overheard in one of the executives' meetings that there's this working group deciding on the new strategy, something clicked in my mind and I immediately said, "This is where risk should be." So I invited myself to those meetings, and since I was new to the company and I was brought in to fix some of the problems that, you know, state audits and external auditors have identified. So I was kind of the problem solver at the time. Nobody knew who I was, and nobody knew what risk management was. So they felt bad about refusing me to come. So they said like, oh, like, like it's, it's, a, it's a big and important thing, but um, like, yeah, whatever, like, come along. A and once they invited me in the, in the, kind of in the process, which, by the way, ended up being like this super secret working group that met on weekends to work on the strategy. Like, that was an amazing exercise. But the only reason I got there, because I was naive enough to not realize how huge it was. And I have I had the courage to ask myself, because, but if I knew how strategic and how important and how uh, super secretive it was, I probably wouldn't have the guts at the time to get it to ask myself to, to be invited. So many risk managers don't really have the courage to approach the decision makers and say, invite us and give us a chance to show you what we can offer. The second reason why that connection doesn't happen is that risk managers, many risk managers still don't have valuable tools to bring. 
So they have the courage and they go, let's do a brainstorming workshop. And executives go like, yeah, but like we're discussing billion dollar investment decisions and like we've we've got models and uh, we already have somebody running scenarios and we discuss this anyway while you're not there. Like wh why do we need another uh, another discussion? Uh, so the tools that risk managers bring to the table are usually weak to be allowed to play in that kind of strategic planning space. Because strategic planning is is quite a sophisticated process. It's actually much more sophisticated than many operational uh, processes. And if the risk manager wants to play at the level of the CFO and CEO and CIO and all the other executives, uh, then he better bring something you know, of equal value to the table, not just discussions. I mean, they can talk about themselves within themselves as well. Um, so that's the second reason why, you know, things, uh, th things don't happen. Uh, on the kind of on the executive side, one of the fundamental reasons many executives have a incomplete vision of what or perception of what risk management is all about. Uh, I mean, I was kind of lucky and unlucky in a way that it was a, I, I was a head of risk of a large government organization, um, investment fund, which was, it had like a, a superstar executive team. So um, our vice presidents and second level vice presidents, like acting vice presidents, they used to be CEOs of large corporations in the country. So that that was the level uh, of um, or, or, of executives there, and and the CEO was like the ex deputy prime minister of the country, and uh, because working with him is such an amazing opportunity, a lot of CEOs gave up their CEO jobs to join as like second and third level executives in in the new company, um, which was an interesting experience because every single one of them came in, and we had our first kind of meeting, and he said. Yeah, we had risk management at my old company, and it was shit. It was absolute rubbish. Like, it was so useful, I fired all risk managers. Because all they did was quarterly risk workshops. They got together. They reviewed this risk register, which made no sense to me whatsoever as a CEO. I had no use for it whatsoever. And um, I ended up firing them all. And I had to go through the whole motions of explaining that we don't do any of that stuff. We don't have risk registers. We use risk management as a decision-making tool. We use scenarios, we use sensitivities, we use simulations, and that would be useful for you making multi-billion dollar investment decisions. And, and, and they're very reluctant to give a chance. I mean, some yeah. some of them we could convert, others we couldn't, but there's there's a very, like risk management as a name, has a, as a profession, has a ruined reputation. Risk management is not perceived as a valuable exercise because 99.9% .9 of what risk managers in all over the world do is not valuable. Executives are not stupid. They can pretend heat maps are useful and they're good for sharing with insurance companies and external auditors and government regulators, but they don't use those heat maps for their own decision making. And that means risk managers are useless to them. They're just a compliance guy who sits, so they will never let a compliance guy who just does some some rubbish for the regulators to participate in the most important decision making cycle in the company. So there's there's a big problem with the reputation of risk because most risk managers deserve that bad reputation. They do rubbish, and uh, um, the second reason why. I think. Yes, go on. I think, I think many companies are missing a, an important step is education in the company, you know. If, for instance, risk management is, uh, is you know, is understood by, you know, not only by the, the risk management section, but others, they can start sharing, okay, this is the value. Okay, and sometimes, uh, you know, um, and I'm speaking about, my, my, but, uh, about myself, I, I took the course uh, for... Um, with uh, also for the certification for the ISO 31000. But, uh, you know, if you are not extending your studies to complete with tools, you know, you are a little bit limited. So you need to research and trying to understand, trying to use the, the best uh, usage of, of the tools. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, 
depending on, especially in high management, is the ones that should uh, motivate people to use risk management. And this is uh, how difficult it is. Sometimes uh, when you go uh, in, in management, it's like, we don't have time for this. Yep, it, it, it's true. And the, the perfect solution, of course, is teaching everybody. And I, I mean, in, in Russia, we do a lot of that. For example, we've introduced risk management as a core competency to many MBA programs. That never existed before. Unless you did a risk management in specific, uh, sorry, unless you did an MBA in specific risk subjects, you probably wouldn't even hear that existed. So we're introducing risk management as a core subject to many MBA programs to make sure executives do learn about that as part of their education. We teach at a lot of corporate universities. And um, the, the last one, it's, it's really not my uh, kind of my achievement, but other people in the country, they uh, integrate risk competencies into undergraduate education, not creating an undergraduate degree in risk management, which I personally feel is absolutely stupid, um, but they add elements like risk subjects into engineering courses, into marketing, management, accounting, finance courses, um, biology, yeah. and so on. So slowly, we kind of we're trying to get to the decision makers and teach them. I, I worked with I work a lot with the um, Institute of Independent Directors. So independent directors also realize that risk is not a compliance exercise, it's not a risk register that they need to sign off, and not a stupid risk appetite statement in non-financial companies that they need to sign off every year. I mean, that's again, that's this is such a nonsense. Um, but it is a, a decision-making tool I instead. However, this tick takes ages, so while we get there, risk managers need to find their own way. And, and sorry, the final thing that I wanted to finish, there are two reasons why the disconnect between risk and strategy, strategic planning doesn't happen is one, executives have a probably incorrect perception of what risk can deliver. And uh, second, if somebody is pushing back on risk management a lot, and if one executive saying, I don't see the value, like, and you know that you've, you've shown them the Monte Carlo simulation, you've shown them like the proper, more reasonable tools, not just, you know, discussion workshops, um, but you've, you, you, you brought something to the table and uh, um, they still pretend that they don't get it or actively push back, that could be an indication that they have a lot at stake. Maybe there's some sort of hidden agenda that they do not want to be uncovered. And that's the reality of business. You know, business is not nice. There are a lot of hidden secrets that risk management being applied can actually bring to the surface and uncover. And that makes a lot of people feel super uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, it was the only reason why I was successful in the debate between risk manager and the CFO in the conversation where um, this strategy doesn't work, we have liquidity, potential liquidity problems. No, we don't have liquidity problems, everything's fine. The only reason why that conversation kind of tilted towards the risk manager and uh, the risk management position was given a chance to be heard and we actually modeled some scenarios and we showed that just how unrealistic that strategy was and how the whole strategy had to be rewritten uh, or readjusted. The only reason why that happened is because some of the executives had their vested interests, had their own agendas and they figured out that for them it would be more beneficial to play on the kind of risk side than on the on the CFO side. If it was the other way around, they would all pretend no risks existed, nothing was uh, the problem, everything was fine. Um, because, you know, human nature, hidden agendas, uh, conflicts of interest, that's a huge part of um, business decision making. And strategic planning is a very, very influential, high stake process like it doesn't get much higher than that that's when you know people make or break careers so, so maybe maybe uh, some risk managers they did everything right and they still cannot get anywhere integrating into strategic planning um, because people say no we don't need it we're fine we do it better than ourselves maybe it's just a battle that you cannot win 
and risk management should not be integrated into strategic planning now, but should be integrated into budgeting or investment decision making or other or like pro- procurement or IT projects into something else. There are a lot of other applications of of risk management. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for your time. This is a, a really great uh, interview, and I I learned a lot. You know, if, if you are an expert, and uh, you are one of my key contributors for the master dissertation for this business school, EAE in Barcelona. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, and okay. good good luck. Thank you. Bye bye.